Welcome to another episode of Power Core Productions and Podcastings. I'm your host, Jerron Harrington, back to hit you in another video. And today, we're going to be relaunching a series that we had over this past summer that recently got discontinued because I felt like I could have done a lot better. And also, at the time of making this series, I didn't think that there would be enough support to warrant making it at the time. However, now I feel like it's a good chance to bring it back. And this series is none other than Neon Genesis Evangelion, The Star of Hope. Now, like you've been wondering before, I've been wanting to do more fandom based series to cross over with a certain Power Ranger team and see how that would affect the story. Our most noticeable one is being the My Hero Academia Heroes of the Morphin Grid series, What If Deku Was a Power Ranger, which is the main focus of our sagas as a whole. And the other spin-offs that we have will all culminate with the My Hero Academia story when we reach the end. Now, you have been asking if the My Hero Academia movies, movies 2 and recently movie 3, yes, they will get an adaptation into the Heroes of the Morphin Grid series as well. My main focus is trying to get to the point where we can conclude the Heroes of the Morphin Grid's main story with Lord Draken, that being the conclusion that will take place in the My Hero Academia story as a whole. And once that story has concluded, then everything will go its separate ways. I was debating if Lord Draken would be the final boss of the My Hero series, or if it would be obviously who it's going to be in the Shigaraki slash All for One. And I've ultimately decided that Draken will be the midway point, so once we get through with Lord Draken, then the story will progress as follows. But all the same though, for this series as a whole with Neon Genesis Evangelion and with Power Rangers Zeo, this story isn't going to be overly long. It's mainly just going to be eight parts where we will cover the original 26 episodes of the anime and I will take light inspiration from the movie End of Evangelion. But other than that though, we're not going to be dealing with the 1.0, 2.0, or 3.0s. We're not going to be delving into those timelines. We are only dealing with the main timeline, the main 26 episodes. Also, as far as if there will be every Ranger team will get a crossover or a mix of sorts, that's not really going to happen for me. It's mainly just going to be key figures that I'm going to use, maybe at most in terms of Heroes of the Morphing Grid outside of My Hero Academia, I'm looking to maybe include five more series as a whole. You already have Neon Genesis Evangelion being one and Jujutsu Kaisen being two. So maybe three or four more teams max will make their own stories, but that's going to be it. I don't want to make anything too overly long. Just going to try to keep it simple in that regard. But I do hope you will enjoy the reboot of this series, something that I've been giving it another look at. And I think this can connect well with the other parts of Heroes of the Morphing Grid to make a very fun and unique sort of series that I think you all will enjoy. So I do hope you will like this reboot. But as always, sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. The Rangers of the My Hero Academia universe were not the only ones feeling the phenomena that was taking place. Lord Dragon and his war against the Rangers on all of the multiverses was taking its toll in various ways. No universe was left unscathed. No one dimension would be overlooked in this conquest. Of course, this was a very long and treacherous battle, one ranger attempting to conquer all across every timeline so that none would ever challenge him in his quest to truly become a god. His battles would eventually lead him into the timeline of the year 1996. This would be the timeline where the rangers had recently converted their powers from Mighty Morphin into that of the Zeo Ranger powers. Lord Draken along with his forces that mainly consisted of many of the former rangers enemies that were now all under his control as well as his ranger sentries had gone to destroying the Zeo rangers despite putting up an amazing fight. 
Lord Draken understood fully the true powers of the Zeo Crystal, knowing that it was a power that was stronger than before. Knowing that a power that could grow over time could eventually come to rival his own powers, and as such he made them among his top priorities of rangers to be taken down. Of course, there was a bit of a sentimental value in doing so, especially at the idea of fighting his own counterpart, the Tommy Oliver who would become the Red Zeo Ranger, Zeo Ranger 5. However, what was even more nostalgic was coming face to face with not only Tommy, but also the Gold Ranger, one who had served as both his friend and ally, but also his adversary, none other than Jason, who at this point in his life had become the Gold Ranger. While the Zeo Rangers tried to put up a fight in defeating Lord Draken and his forces, they ultimately proved to be too much. As the Rangers were defeated one by one, Jason would attempt to get into Pier Minus, trying to take Tommy with him so that they could flee. However, Tommy knew that he was too badly injured, and he had no choice but to stay and fight. Pier Minus was not at 100%, but it had to get off world as best it could. Jason had collected the morphers from the other fallen Rangers. The only ones that he didn't have was Tommy's. Tommy would demorph and give the morpher to Jason, telling him to get the Zeo power out of there, knowing full well that Lord Dragon was more than likely going to attempt to seal away the Zeo power from the morphers, to merge them back into the Zeo crystal and use them as a weapon. Spearheaded by the Machine Empire, how having the royal family been executed by Lord Dragon, and now their generals and the Machine Army falling under his command, they were the forefront bears in the assault. While Jason wanted to stay and fight, he knew that it might be a losing battle. To fight all these enemies at once with no help at all, as the five were the only ones that had remained at the time. Jason would look as eyed as he would take the morpher from Tommy. As Tommy would push him away into Pier Minus, as Jason would begin to fly off into space to get as far away as he could. As Tommy stood behind, he would come face to face with Lord Dragon. Dragon, in a bit of irony, would remove his helmet. Seeing his younger self fall to his knees, the weight and the guilt crushing him, as he realized that it was he himself who caused this chaos. Jason would pilot Pier Minus through space. As fast as he was going, he was burning through the Zord's energy rather quickly. Pyramidus had thankfully had the other Zords stored inside of it. Of course, this was only the five basic Zeo Ranger Zords. The other auxiliary Zords had been destroyed in the conflict. However, thankfully Pyramidus did have the data so that they could be rebuilt if necessary. As he was chased through space by the armada of the Machine Empire, Lord Dragon gave the generals orders to not return without the Zeo powers. The generals agreeing that they wouldn't fail their new master as they chased Jason all through space. As they eventually made their way through, they would come across a wormhole. The wormhole would suck in Pyramidus along with a bulk of the Machine Empire as well as the generals. Quickly as the wormhole had appeared, it would vanish. The other members of the armada wouldn't know where they had gone. The wormhole did not only just take them to another dimension, but another place in time. And while dimensional travel was at his disposal, it was not as easy as you may think it is. It took a lot of careful planning and coordination, and there was never any telling what world you might go to. And more often than not, trying to get to the same world twice was rather difficult. As such, Jason, as well as the Machine Empire, were effectively stranded in whatever dimension they were in, until they could potentially find a way to get back out. It seemed to have only lasted before an instant, as Jason, inside of Pyramidus, would eventually find himself on a course for Earth. This would confuse him a little, as he could have sworn that he had just left Earth. However, this Earth would not be the same one that he had left. The Machine Empire in the meantime would be running low on fuel as well and would need a chance to recharge. 
they would send a small squadron of cog soldiers to follow Pyramidus to Earth and to find whatever they could about it, as they would make a base for themselves on the moon, similar to what they had done in their own timeline. As Jason would arrive into Earth's atmosphere, he would be detected by those of Nerve headquarters. Nerve was already dealing with one situation. If a second angel were to show up, then there was no telling what they could do. At this moment, their new recruit had recently arrived and had now been thrusted into a situation he did not want to be in. The recruit was none other than the young Shinji Ikari, son of the commander Gendo Ikari. As the young boy had recently arrived into Tokyo 3, his first orders was to hop into the Ava, as the angel had now attacked and their previous pilot was in no condition in order to pilot one of the Evangelion. Of course, Shinji had no desire to be a pilot at all, but at the same time he knew that there was a sense of duty, as there was no one left who could fight against the angels. As Shinji would be pinned down by one of the angels, Jason would find Pyramidus hovering over Tokyo 3. He would see the situation at hand, and through some of the radio frequency, he would just faintly be able to pick up nerve, nerve's frequency. In doing so, he could hear the situation and what was happening. He couldn't understand everything fully, but he could tell that there was a child inside one of those things and that it was trying to fight this monster, kind of similar to a ranger in a lot of ways. Jason would hurry over to Shinji. Using pure minus, he would blast away at the angel. Shinji and the Eva would fall down. Pyramides would morph into its Megazord form, using what was left of its remaining energy. It would shoot a final blast, a conjoint power of all of the zeal power in the Zord at the moment, destroying the angel completely, giving them a sigh of relief. However, now there was even more confusion going on amongst those of Nerve, as well as Jason and even Shinji. He had no idea what was going on. What was this pyramid-like robot and where had it come from? And how on earth was it able to one-shot an angel? The people in Nerve were also just as confused. Misato Kusaragi was left speechless. She, along with Miss Rasuto, as well as the others, they had no idea what was going on here. Who had such technology? Had another country built their own weapon to fight the angels? They were trying to get answers, but according to all the other major nations, no one had built such a device, and it was said to have come from space. So there was no telling just what this being was and what it was capable of. As Pyramidus would turn around to face Ava Unit 1, the purple and green like monstrosity would get back to his feet as Shinji would start to suffer a major migraine. Shinji would start to see a vision. He wasn't quite sure of what it was. In this vision, he felt his arm being ripped apart. It felt so real that his own left arm started to experience pain. In the vision, he felt the angel was still fighting him. He felt it shooting it through the head he could feel the excruciating pain from that moment. He could see himself desperately clawing and scratching at the angel. Unknowingly, he was seeing the original timeline. For whatever reason, the arrival of Jason at this moment had changed the course of humanity in ways that no one was truly expecting. And the bridge between the old world and the new world was none other than Shinji Ikari. Shinji would fly into a rage inside of the Ava, as the Ava would go and attack at Pyramidus. Jason would attempt to try to get the boy to calm down, however it was easier said than done. The people of Nerve wouldn't know what to do either. They didn't know if this pyramid robot was friend or foe, but at the same time it helped to stop one of the angels. Whether it was friend or foe was something that would have to be questioned later. Right now. They had to figure out what this thing was and if it was on their side. If it was, 
then this might just be their best chance to fight against the angels. It had only been 15 years since their last attack, and now, there was no telling what might happen. One thing was for sure, their impact had to be prevented at all costs. If it was allowed to continue, it would result in the end of humanity. Jason would struggle against the Evangelion, the two of them squaring off as they would lock arms, neither one backing down. Ultimately though, as the power cable had been discharged from the Evangelion's skull, it would eventually low, run low on fuel before falling over, Shinji passing out in the process. Jason would be relieved that thankfully no one had gotten seriously hurt. However, he was suffering from his own wounds and was in no condition to move any further. He would pass out in the control room as well and fall over. Neither of the machines would be able to move at all. Nerve would send out the recovery team to pick up both of the robots immediately. Jason would be found inside of Pyramidus and would be removed, his suit being taken off before it would eventually vaporize back into the morphing grid. Inside they were able to find the man, and they could confirm that he was indeed human. Nothing about him was angel, nothing was foreign. He was indeed a human, but there was no record of him on Earth. No data, no file, no identity, nothing. He was a human, but it was almost as if he wasn't from this world at all. However, the more serious note was that he was in critical condition. He would be rushed to the ER along with Shinji, as the both of them would be given time to rest and to recover. Not too long after, Jason would awaken. He would find himself in a hospital room. He would see over to his left that his morpher had been left on a table. As he would slowly get up, the door would open as a nurse would come in. She would explain to him what happened as he could see that his body had been bandaged. Behind him he would see a woman that would be around his age. She was pretty beautiful, wearing a black like skirt along with a red jacket and her flowing purplish like hair. Well, seems you got yourself a bit of trouble now, didn't you, pal? <clears throat> yeah, you could say that. Who are you? Oh, me? I'm Misato Kusaragi, and I have to say thank you for taking care of Shinji. Shinji? You mean whoever it was that was piling that thing? Mm-hmm. The Evangelion. While I am grateful to you, I do have to make this very clear. What you say right now could determine a lot of things. Determine? Yes. You see, we don't know who you are or where you've come from, but you have technology capable of going toe to toe with the angels. That's pretty impressive. Also, your suit or whatever it is seems to show that you have more than whatever it is that you could be letting on, so I'm going to ask you this one time. Who are you and where did you come from? <clears throat> My name's Jason. I'm Jason Lee Scott from Earth. Earth? Well, we can confirm that you are human, but we have no identification for you. What do you mean? I'm from Angel Grove in the United States. There is no Angel Grove, Jason. What? Angel Grove doesn't exist in our world. You're, you're joking, there can't be... How is Angel Grove not... Hold on. What year is it? The year is 2015. No, it's, it can't be 2015. Really? What year do you think it is? The year's supposed to be 1996. That's where I came from. Where you came from? You're not making any sense to me, Jason. Can you kind of explain it to me? <sighs> Let me ask you this. Does this world have Power Rangers? Power Rangers? Oh no. 
You're telling me you've never heard of the Power Rangers. I'm sorry, but nope. No history of Power Rangers here. Is that what you are? Is that what your robot is? No, it's called a Zord. A Zord, huh? Well, tell me more about the Power Rangers. Jason would try his best to explain who and what the Power Rangers were. He would explain the timeline that he had come from and everything that had happened up until this point. Of course, if you were telling this to anyone else, they would look at you and think you had gone completely mad. However, in this world, the things that often seem extraordinary can often be just your everyday average event. And for Masato, she could sense that Jason wasn't lying. He was indeed telling the truth. While it might seem far-fetched, kids piling Avas to fight angels was also just as far-fetched. Cities that can be buried underground would seem to be far-fetched. However, this was their reality. Even though she was grateful, this also left her with a lot of burning questions. If the Power Rangers had this much power and capability, was it really necessary to even pilot the Avas anymore? Of course, a lot of manpower and work had been put into using them, and to just bring up the idea of shutting down the Evangelion altogether would be one that would have to be out of the question, but even still, maybe it was because of Shinji's inexperience, or maybe it was just that Zord would be more powerful, but all the same. The results were the results. If they had the power to one-shot angels, this could be the type of tide and battle that they were looking for. Not too long after, Commander Gendo Ikari would arrive into the room as well. The air would suddenly become a lot more colder, as the tension would start to grow. Even if Jason wouldn't say it outright, he could tell just by looking at this man that he was not one with the purest of intents. He might not be the enemy, but he damn sure wasn't an ally. Gendo would sit at the foot of the bed, not losing eye contact with Jason and nor Jason with Gendo. As the two would stare each other down, it was pretty obvious to the two of them that they were both experienced when it came to things like battle and loss. They knew what it meant to fight. So, you're the one who was able to pilot that machine. That's right. My name's Jason Lee Scott. And you? I'm Commander Gendo Ikari of Nerve. I have to ask, how on earth were you able to build such a device? And just where have you come from? Jason would give Gendo the same story that he had given Misato. However, not in the friendliest of terms. However, it got the job done none the same. Once everything was put into order, Gendo would now have many decisions to make. He had to speak to the World Council, and the World Council had just as many questions for him as he did for the Council itself. The Council wanted to learn more about this Zord and who piloted it. If he was human from Earth, just where had he come from? He claimed to be from Angel Grove in the United States, but the United States had no such place known as Angel Grove, and even more so, he had no identification. Of course, the United States tried to play hardball. If he was claiming he was from the United States, then this could be just the sort of power play they could make, stating that if he genuinely was from the United States, even if it was from a supposed another dimension, then technically he still had U.S. citizenship, meaning that in all likelihood, he would still be required to represent the United States. However, the other members of the committee would say that it would be rather unethical, staying as how he was from another world altogether, a world that didn't have angels, although it would be pointed out that he had other rogues that he had to fight. They would refer to Gendo, asking for his opinion. Gendo would state that he would still continue the research on the Evangelion, but that with their permission, he would also like to work with the Zords as well. Whatever these Power Rangers were, they could provide a new power, something that they could use in their fight against the Angels. 
The council would agree and allow him to make a decision with his best discretion. In the meantime, Jason and Shinji would soon exit out of the hospital, where they would arrive to Nerve headquarters. Jason getting a first chance to meet the young boy, he would shake his hand, and Shinji would thank him for saving his life. As they would meet and discuss before their living arrangements, Misato would be shocked that Shinji of all people wouldn't want to live with anyone, and instead that he would be staying by himself. Not wanting to let the boy be on his own, she decided to take it upon herself to take not only Shinji but Jason with her as well, and that she would let them crash at her place. Of course, Ritsuko wouldn't like the idea, knowing just how wild her friend could get at times. She had had some hope and decency that she wouldn't make a move on Shinji of all people, but Jason was an older boy and was fair game and they didn't know anything about him. However, Misato would explain that she was a capable fighter, and if he got out of line, she could always just put a bullet in his head. Of course, for Jason, while he did laugh at the thought, even he kind of knew ultimately that she wouldn't be able to take him down, although he hoped that it wouldn't come to that. All the same, the three would hop into her car as they speeded through Tokyo 3. Jason would be in awe as he had never actually seen Tokyo, even in his own world. He would be shocked at how advanced their technology was, although a lot of it was still pretty similar. Of course that being that in their world, the technology hadn't advanced in the ways that he had expected. While it was futuristic, it wasn't too uncommon. In fact, even the cell phones were still the same for the most part, give or take being a bit more fancier and having a bit more gadgets and tricks to them. Shinji would just be in awe of Jason. Jason had a level of confidence and aura to him, something that he just couldn't really explain. While in the car, Jason would speak of his time as a Power Ranger, telling of what they were and what they stood for. All of this would actually inspire Shinji even more. He felt a strange bond to Jason in a weird way. The type of bond that a son might have if he had a father to be proud of. More so than what he could say for his own. The three would stop to pick up dinner before they would eventually arrive at the apartment where they would all be staying at. It was easy to see that Misato wasn't really much of a cleaner, seeing as how her home was much more of a pigsty than anything else. And Jason could see that she had a love for beer. Of course, Jason was at a legal age so that he could drink, although having beer wasn't really much of his thing though. They would all stop to eat and they would make small talk for a while, but they weren't really sure of what to say. I mean, it's not every day that you have someone from another dimension just arrive to your world and then the next thing you know you're treating them to a meal. However, all the same though, they were cordial enough. Shinji would be in for a surprise though as he would attempt to go take a shower, only to run into Misato's pet slash roommate, Pen Pen the Penguin. After their living arrangements were put into order, Misato would reveal that she had two other bedrooms that would be available. Shinji would have one and Jason would have the other. However, Shinji couldn't really sleep very much. He would sit in the living room as he would look out towards the full moon. As he did so, Jason would walk in and he would ask him how he were doing. Well, it's just, I don't know. I mean, from everything you've told me, you and your friends, they sound so brave and heroic. I mean, I just wish that I could be like that, you know? Well, Shinji, I wouldn't really say that it's just about being brave. A lot of things have happened in my life. I am sorry for you though. It must not have been easy to leave them behind. No, it wasn't. But, you know, sometimes when it comes to about life, you, you gotta do the things that you may not want to do. But I like to think that maybe things will get better. So, 
What are you going to do in the meantime? Do you think you'll ever be able to get back home? To be honest, I'm not entirely sure. I'm not really versed in interdimensional travel. Maybe I could someday, but for the most part, I'm stuck here. But while I'm here in the meantime, you guys seem like you could use a hand. But you've been through so much. You've lost your friends, your family, and how can, how can I keep fighting? To be honest, I don't know myself. For the longest time, it was always about being a Power Ranger, fighting the good fight. I've won and I've lost. Right now, I don't know what I can do. I could sit around all day and cry about it, feel sorry for myself, but in the end that won't get me anywhere, Shinji. I have to keep moving forward. It's what I was meant to do. Jason would finish his speech as he would go to walk back to his room. However, as he did so, Shinji would ask him one thing. Do you think... What is it, Shinji? Do you think I could ever be like you? I don't see why you can't. You got a good heart, kid. Get some sleep. For Shinji, as well as Jason and Nerve, there were many things that had to be decided. Were they going to continue to use the Ava? Or were they going to use the powers of the Morphing Grid? Jason had explained it as much as he could, although he wasn't really well versed in tech. They were able to see the massive pros and cons between the Zords and the Avas. The Avas had to be connected to a power supply within the city, or something that they could carry with them, so traveling wouldn't be as easy for them, and the power that they burned through wouldn't really justify the ends of the means for every time they fought an angel. Even if they did have government funding, in the long run, it just wasn't really practical. However, the Zords seemed to be able to charge themselves on solar power, or at the very least, they could recharge their own batteries through some unknown force. Unknown to the people of Nerve, the Zords were actually connected to the Morphing Grid. Whenever they weren't in use, then they were able to charge their own energy from that dimension. However, it would take some time and a few of the Zords had been badly damaged and needed to be repaired. Outside of Pure Midas, which was suffering from the most power depletion, and wouldn't be able to be in commission for some time, there were the other five Auxiliary Zords, the Zords that belonged to the Core 5 Rangers, Zero Rangers 1-5, through five, Pink, Yellow, Blue, Green, and Red. Their power wasn't completely depleted, and in fact they would be fully operational, with Nerve working and looking through the databases, able to learn whatever that they could about the Morphing Grid, it didn't take too long to convert some of the resources that were used for the Evangelion into the Zords, repairing them and getting them up to operation. For Shinji, his training would be twofold. While he spent his mornings learning how to use the Ava, Although the Ava was a bit unstable at the moment and he could only use the combat simulator, he was still getting the hang of it. Although it didn't feel natural to be inside of that thing. Every time he was inside, it always felt as if he were invading something that shouldn't be invaded. If he had to describe it, it would be as if you were somehow inside of someone else's body and piloting it. It didn't feel natural. It was like a forced harmony in a way. In the meantime, Jason would also take to asking Shinji if he would potentially want to be a ranger. Of course, much like his master Zordon, Jason was never going to force this option onto Shinji. Although he also recognized that if he were going to fight, he was going to need backup. Maybe there was a lesson to be learned in recruiting children to fight in a man's war. But, he had always looked at it from a different perspective. The rangers that had been chosen weren't like the average citizen. They were different, at least in a way that was enough for them to be rangers. 
and he felt as though he could trust Shinji to be one as well. Shinji would be on the fence about it, although he wasn't entirely sure if he wanted to be a ranger just yet. He would have some practice. A simulator had been made to mirror the Red Phoenix Zord, and Shinji would get some time to fly in it, basically learning how to fly a plane so to speak, and for whatever reason, this felt much more better to him. Flying inside of the Red Phoenix, it didn't feel like it was a forced relationship, something that Shinji naturally hated above all else. It felt organic. It felt like two beings were coming together as one to become something even greater than themselves. He couldn't really describe the feeling, but he could tell that it was something that he could get used to. In the meantime, Shinji would soon be going to school, and it wouldn't be too long after that his identity as being one of the Ava pilots would be revealed. Among them would be a young boy with fuzzy like hair and with glasses, who seemed to have a thrill in the robots and the Avas and the angels. His name would be Kensuke, along with his friend, a rather tall and stoic boy with a buzz like haircut, who wasn't really too fond of the pilot, especially since his last fight, he and whoever that strange pilot was in the pyramid like robot had caused damage to the city that ended up getting his sister hurt. This would result in him finding Shinji after school and punching him in the face. Shinji would relent that he didn't really want to be a pilot in the first place. Toji would go back to want to punch him a second time. However, before he would get a chance to get the punch in, Jason would arrive and catch his fist. Hey now, there's no need to get violent here. Shinji, what seems to be the problem? Shinji would keep his head down as he didn't really want to talk. But Kensuke would get up to speak. Hey, it's nothing, sir. It's just that my friend here, he's not really too fond of Shinji. You see, his sister got hurt in the attack yesterday, and... Kensuke, shut up. You don't have to tell my business to everyone. Oh, I see. Your sister got hurt in the attack. I'm terribly sorry about that. I didn't mean to cause any trouble. Trouble? Don't tell me, are you? Yeah, I'm the guy that piloted the second. Before Jason had a chance to finish, Toji would go for a right hook to his face. But Jason would easily catch him before slamming him gently to the ground. <clears throat> you kid. You know you can't just punch your way through everything. Sh shut up, you damn bastard! My sister got hurt because of you! I understand, and I'm sorry. But do you think lashing out is really going to solve anything? Toji would get up and push Jason off, before merely grunting as he would walk away. Kinsuke would bow, telling Jason and Shinji that he was sorry, as the two would head back into the building. From there, Rei Ayama would show up, Shinji and Jason both being shocked to see that she was still bandaged the way that she was, but that she still managed to attend school of all things. Seeing her the way that she was, it actually started to make Jason wonder if giving these powers to children were really the right thing after all. He had never really stopped to question it, but in a way, what were the Power Rangers but children of war? Child soldiers? Was it really justifiable to put that much faith into them? In the end, looking at how things had turned out, especially with Lord Dragon, was it really for the best that the Rangers simply not exist? Of course, they wouldn't have too long to debate, as Ray would explain that the city was going under lockdown as another angel was making his way. Shinji, Jason, and Rei would rush back to Nerve headquarters as they would get themselves prepared for the next attack. Rei wouldn't be able to fight and Shinji would get into the Ava Unit 1. Of course, Jason wouldn't be able to use Pyramidas, but he still could assist in some way. 
That was when another alert would come up on the screen. On the screen, they would see robotic-like beings. Jason recognized them as the cogs. They would ask more about what these cogs were, but however, Jason would simply yell at them to let him handle the cogs and let Shinji handle the angel. Knowing full well that if the cogs were here, then it meant that whoever had come from the machine empire couldn't have been too far as well, and they were a threat that needed to be taken down. Jason wasn't at 100%, but he knew he had the fight. Shinji would get into the Ava unit and would attempt to go online. However, the connection would be completely rejected, as the commanding cell would be forced out of the Ava skull. Shinji falling out of it as it seemed as though he were being rejected somehow. Everyone in Nerve was beginning to panic. They needed to have something that could fight against the Angel. Shinji couldn't even get inside of his Ava unit, it wasn't working at all. And Commander Ikari wasn't even at Nerve at the moment, he was off handling other business. With Misato now effectively in charge, she now had decisions to make. What were they supposed to do? Maybe he could use Ava Unit Zero, but that one was also unstable. The first and second child's Avas were in no condition to be used, and the third unit was in Germany at the time. They only had one option, but that was only if they were willing to play it. They had the Morphers stored away safely, so that they could be used when the time came. Misato would go to the safe, while Ritsuko and the others would warn her not to go through with something so rash. However, since she was the commanding officer at the moment, her word would be law. She knew that they had to find some way to fight against the angels, and this was the only thing that they had. She would reach inside and grab the Xeonizer, the one for the Red Phoenix. Zero Ranger 5 Red. She would give it to Shinji, as Shinji had had some practice with morphing. Of course, he couldn't get it right the first few times, but he could get it done with some practice. Although he didn't think he'd be using it this early, or that they had been pushed to this point. Y you want me to use the Ranger powers? Yes, Shinji. We really don't have a choice here. The AVA units aren't working for whatever reason. The signal seems to be... I don't even know, but this is all we have at the moment. Can you do it, Shinji? Shinji would start to question if he really could. However, seeing the angel as it was getting closer to Tokyo 3, and knowing the lives that would be in danger, he knew that even if he didn't want to, this was something that he needed to do. He would take the Xeonizer as he would get himself into position, heading out to the platform to morph. <sighs> okay, I can do this. I can do this. Just focus. Zero Ranger 5, red. Shinji would put the two parts of the morpher together. As the unit would click and the Xeonizer would activate, would be encased in a red-like grid as his body would go through the morphing process as his DNA would fuse along into the morpher. Eventually what would be seen would be a young red field. He would be feeling the power coursing through his veins. He could feel himself as if he had been completely energized, as if he had gained a power that was unlocked. able to charge up the Zord so that they could be fully operational much faster than before. However, Pure Minus would still need time as it was in critical recovery. While Jason was in one of the fire pilots as he had morphed into the Gold Ranger, he would be able to hear through the Ranger communicator that Shinji was online now. He would congratulate him while he was heading over to the far end of the district to battle the Cogs. He would stay on the frequency with Shinji, 
and walk him through how they use the Zord. Shinji would get inside of the Red Phoenix as he would fly off into the sky to do battle with the Angel. The Angel would have a large serpent-like body as it would slither and move through the air. Energy like tendrils would emit from its body as it would whip around at the buildings that were used as covers and defenses for the city. One of the major benefits of having the Zords was that it didn't require a power line or a cable, so it gave him free range to fight. Shinji would walk through his instructions, doing just as he was told. He would remember to take deep breaths and to calm down, the Red Phoenix flying in the air as it did battle with the Angel. The Angel's AT field put up a good defense, however, the power of the morphing grid coursing through the Zords was able to act as a counter, allowing them to be able to pierce through the AT fields if they weren't strong enough. In doing so, as this was only the fourth angel, a rather low ranking one at that, its AT field wouldn't be entirely strong, giving Shinji and the Red Phoenix just enough power to outdo it. In the meantime, Toji and Kinsuke would be underground in the bunker. However, Kinsuke would remark to Toji that he was being a little too harsh on Shinji, and he was basically trying to go with him into the two of them sneaking off, so that they could go outside and watch the battle. He wanted to get a chance to truly see it up close. Toji would relent, but they would eventually go outside. Heading over to the far cliff, they would see not what they were expecting at all. Instead of seeing the Ava, they were seeing a red like Phoenix fire pilot. Kinsuke would be amazed as he used his video camera to film everything that was happening. He wondered if it was Shinji who was piloting it. However, it wouldn't take too long for them to find out, as the angel would use its tendrils to wrap around one of the wings of the red Phoenix. It would soon find itself crashing into the side of the mountain, being pinned down, one of its wings being crushed. While Shinji wouldn't feel any pain from this, he would start to panic in a sense, getting flashbacks of being inside of the Ava, as well as being detected that there were two other humans on the cliffside. Shinji would open the back door latch so that the two could get inside as they made their way to the cockpit. There they would see the Red Ranger, but they could hear that through the voice that it was Shinji inside of it. They would ask him just what this was and what he was doing. Shinji wouldn't really be able to explain. The main focus was getting them out of the grip of the angel. It would be at this moment where Shinji would suffer from another migraine. His mind would go blurry as he would see a vision. It would be similar to this very moment, except Shinji wasn't in the Red Phoenix. He was in the Evangelion. He was in his Ava pilot suit, Toji and Kinsuke was behind him, and he would see himself stabbing away at the angel, feeling his mind beginning to break as the emergency power was starting to drain. All of it felt like it was too much for him. However, the vision wouldn't last very long as he would find himself back in the original world, now in the Red Phoenix. He would point its cannon directly into the weak point of the angel. Focusing his aim, he would blast but he would be off by a few meters. However, Kinsuke would grab hold of one of the firing weapons. Giving him some help, he would be able to angle the blaster just right and get the perfect shot. Toji and Shinji would be surprised, however Kinsuke would reveal that he was an expert when it came to being a marksman, as it was something that he loved to do. Now seeing just how powerful in his skills he truly was, they would use him to assist in blasting away at the angel, until eventually it was defeated. Shinji would use all of the auxiliary power into the final blast that would destroy the angel completely. With the angel now out of the way, Shinji and the others would exit out of the Zord that its left wing had been damaged and it would need some time to be prepared. In the meantime, a plane would arrive and the two would be picked up along with Shinji. 
However, instead of heading back to headquarters, they would be sent out immediately to the far end of the district. The cogs were attacking, and they could tell that they were going to need backup. A few of the other Nerf soldiers would be inside, with their guns at the ready to fight the cogs. Shinji would look at his tool belt where he would see his sword and blaster, wondering if this was what he was supposed to use to fight with. Toji and Kensuke would be asked to stay inside of the plane as they touched down. There in front of the public square, they would see Jason completely surrounded. He hadn't fully recovered, but he was doing just enough to hold off the cogs. As the other soldiers would arrive and take cover, a battle would begin in the streets, man versus machine. Shinji wasn't sure what to do either. He would be staying at the far end, not too far from the plane. Covering behind one of the cars, he would stay back from a distance and attempt to shoot, although he would have very poor aim. Toji and Kensuke would hide behind along with Shinji, Kensuke trying to explain to Shinji how to shoot and how to remain calm when he did so, although Shinji would be a nervous wreck as he had no idea what he was doing. In that event, a stray blast would hit him in the head. Thankfully his helmet protected him, but all the same he still fell over, with his head ringing as he would start to experience another vision in a panic attack. While Toji tried to help him up, Kensuke would grab one of the blasters that he had seen fall from Shinji's hands. He could feel that it was different from any other gun. However, as he looked back and he saw the cogs heading their way, he would take aim and fire, not missing a single shot as he would start to mow down through the cogs, even better than some of the nerf soldiers were. Toji would see his sword and he would pick it up also. A few of the cog stragglers had managed to get through from Kinsuke's blasts. However, for any that got through, Toji would give it a nice swing of the sword and their heads would come flying off, although his arms would be completely numb as trying to cut through solid metal with a sword wasn't easy. It was only thanks to the ranger powers and to hard training that Jason was able to do so, but for a kid just doing it on his first try it was no easy task. Although Toji was no ordinary boy in that regard, as he spent a lot of time working out and taking out his aggressions, so it made him a bit more stronger. The two would work together and take down a few of the cogs as Shinji would get back up on his feet. Using one of the power weapons that he had at his disposal, he would go into the fray alongside with Jason. The two standing back to back, the gold and the red Zeo Ranger as they would take on the remaining cogs. As there were only a few left, Jason would tell Shinji to get down. His golden staff would change into spear mode. Not wanting to use this technique too much, he would use a speed like attack where he would blitz all around the battlefield, taking out what remained of the cogs all at once. This wasn't an attack that he should have been using at the time as his body had not been completely recovered from all the damage he had taken from his previous battle with Lord Dragon. However, he was only needed to use the tap just long enough to take out the remaining cogs, so everything was fine, at least for now. Jason would walk over to Kensuke and Toji and commend them for their efforts, stating that they had the makings of a true ranger. Seeing all of this, Jason would think to himself that just maybe, maybe they might be what this world needed after all. In the events of the attack, Gendo would eventually arrive back to Nerve, where he would be given a full report on everything that happened. He could see that, for whatever reason, Jason's presence was having a profound effect on everyone around him, in a lot of ways that even he couldn't completely describe. A few days later, Shinji would be called into Nerf headquarters along with Toji and Kinsuke. Toji and Kinsuke had been chewed out by their teachers as well as their other adults for getting involved in something so dangerous. Of course, Kinsuke didn't have parents, so there was no one to really tell on him. And for Toji, 
his uncle and his father worked in different cities and they couldn't really be bothered to check in on their son. And for that matter, they couldn't be bothered to check in on their niece and daughter either. So they were all they had. As they arrived, Toji would be informed that his sister would be taken to a private hospital of nerve where her wounds would be treated with the best medicine available. He would be surprised by this and he would ask just what was the catch. However, there was no catch necessarily, but they did have an offer. Inside of a room, Jason would be waiting for them, as he would explain the situation at hand. He would say that at the moment, they needed all the power they could get if they were going to defeat the angels. And he looked at the three of them and thought that they would be the best candidates to be rangers. Of course, he had no intention of forcing this upon them, and even if Toji refused, his sister would still be given proper care. Jason had fought for this especially, as it was due to him and Shinji's fight that caused her injury in the first place, and this was his way of getting compensation. Jason had to admit that deep down he didn't completely trust all of Nerve. There was just an uneasy feeling about it. And if he was really going to do this, then he was going to have a hands-on role. He wasn't just going to trust his power over to the others so easily. If they were going to pick rangers and pick people to fight beside them, then he was going to see to it personally. As Gendo would look down from his commanding tower above, there was a new wave entering on the horizon. It was unknown of what was to happen, or what dangers would be along the way. Up until now, humanity had no hope. Humanity had no chance. But now it did. No matter how small, they had a chance to change the fate of history. Whether or not they would succeed or fail, they would simply have to wait and see. As now, the dawn of Zeo had arrived into the world, and the war had now officially evolved. It was no longer just the Avas who would have a role to play in the survival of Earth, but now it would be that of the Rangers. The Power Rangers, Zeo. This concludes Neon Genesis Evangelion, The Star of Hope, based on the Heroes of the Morphing Grid series. For all this and more, please don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, share, and hit that bell for post notifications so you can stay up to date on everything that is Power Core Productions and Podcastings that has to come out now and in the future. Stay tuned for tomorrow's video as we delve into What If Tondro Had Venom, Demon Slayer, Dark Fury. But as always, I'm Javon Harrington with Power Core Productions and Podcastings. Signing off, and I'll see you next time.